Uh, just to put that in, in perspective, Carol Evans is 92, uh, so I'm not quite up with him. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I was reasonably fit, but the story starts about six months before uh, the video you saw, um, where I just started a low carb, high fat diet. And that's all these foods. So, to sum up my low carb running performance, uh, if we go back in time, one month into low carb, I ran a half marathon in an hour, 26 minutes. It's not world record breaking, but it, it's not bad for, for an amateur. Uh, six months into low carb is when I had my test at the University of Florida and a VO2 max of 70, uh, so I was fit by every measure. And eight months into low carb, I was maintaining a training schedule of about 150 kilometers a week. So if you run, I've got no doubt that you can definitely do that in low carb. But in my opinion, where low carb performance really shines when it comes to body composition. And what they also did at the University of Florida, they put me in a body composition test, a thing called a bot pod. And it came out that I had 16.7% of body fat. And what you see there, so I'm right at the bottom of the normal range, that's uh, across the population. So I'm still within the normal range, but I'm right at the low end. Well, that wasn't really a surprise because, you know, I had a VO2 max of 70 and I was fit. So if we compare that, which is five years ago now, roughly, to just last week where I went and had a DEXA scan, which you know you do here in Adelaide. So five years later, five years older, and I came in at 12% body fat. So in five years, I had dropped quite a bit of body fat. If we look at the action numbers that came out of that, I have to apologize for showing myself in my swim trunks, <laughs> but it's the only way I can illustrate what I do. Uh, I dropped about three kilos in body weight, but I had maintained my lean mass, which is your organ, bone, muscles, and your connective tissues. Gone up slightly, but not a lot, but I dropped about three and a half kilos of fat. So the question is though, why did I get leaner? Now, I won't go into all the details, but um, I got very convinced through a bit of research that I was becoming insulin resistant when I was, at the time I was running. So, this is my illustration of insulin resistance. It's not as elaborate, but basically the food comes in your bloodstream. Your muscle and organ cells have a very hard time absorbing that to use and burn up as energy but your fat cells remain insulin sensitive, so they absorb most of that and make it into fat. So that's a very simplified explanation. And I have no doubt that the reason I dropped three and a half kilos of fat was because I regained my insulin sensitivity, which is this now. So the reverse, you're burning up most of that sugar or energy, and very little is getting shuttled into your fat cells. The thing is though, how did I go from being resistant to becoming sensitive again? There's two factors. And the first one is that I stopped running. Now, the reason I worked that out was because I started digging into a little bit of <coughs> medical literature and I found this uh, study done on called the post-marathon paradox. Basically it was marathon runners that remained insulin resistance in days after competing a marathon. <coughs> Yet they were, they were glucose and glycogen depleted. So really in a nutshell, if you over-exercise, you can damage your cell membranes so that you'll, you'll become insulin resistant that way. So at that time, this is what my training schedule was. So I wasn't running a marathon, but I was running half a marathon most days. So I stopped that. <coughs> and there was another factor that you can probably guess what that is. Anybody want to take a guess? No? Yeah. Well, I've remained on my low carb, high fat diet right throughout to this day. So 
So this is basically what it looks like. Um, went from dropped in body fat after I stopped running over five years. So in my opinion, body composition is where low carb really shines if you're into that. Uh, I've written extensively about this on my blog. Um, obviously there's more to the story and uh, you can look that up if you like, including my um, interview with Dr. Perlmutter. Okay, so let's switch gears to my present low-carb physical performance, and that's as a track rate rider. Just to give you an idea what it is that I do uh, on a daily basis, here's like a 10 second video. So as you can see, it's not really a pony club. <laughs> uh, I do that from 4.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. every morning, six days a week. And how I fuel that is, I start my day at 4 a.m. with coffee and cream. Then I go and play with the horses for four and a half hours. And I have my first meal around 10 a.m. And it usually looks something like this. Or, lately I've been getting into just plain yogurt. Or, sometimes it looks like that. <laughs> I don't have anything. Which the other advantage, as people will tell you, who's on this diet, is that you can go for long stretches without really requiring to eat. My second meal is usually around 5 p.m. And in that time frame, I usually just have water throughout the day. That's about it. And it'll look very similar to breakfast. Sometimes I do indulge a bit and have some dessert. I might have some uh, little bit of apple cheese and dark chocolate. Or I might have the same what I had tonight. Nothing. Because I'm here talking to you guys, so I didn't have time to eat. So that means tomorrow morning uh, I'll be getting on the horses about 18 hours faster. Except I will have my cream and coffee though. So if you ride horses for a living, I highly recommend that you can do that on a low carb diet. <laughs> but then some people tell me, well, what about brute strength? Well, it's not really a professional video, but it's another 10 second clip. Oh, there we go. So as far as I'm concerned in, in my little experiment, I think you can also maintain your strength in this diet. So what does my current diet look like? Well, I showed you a few pictures before. Brunch and dinner is the two meals a day I have, just like Peter. And they look pretty similar. And you can see there it's mainly meat and eggs, which is a big part of a low carb, high fat diet. But does anybody see anything missing from that? Yes, that whole section there. Um, for the last 12 months, I've really been on a, a low fiber diet, which means I really don't eat vegetables or any plant matter for that. Except maybe my little apple there when I have dessert. Um, so I call it a low fiber diet. I mean, low fiber doesn't mean no fiber, because you do get some fiber, as I said, through apple and actually dark chocolate. And to be exact, you get about three and a half grams of what's on that plate. When people see this, they go, 3.6 grams, that's pretty accurate. How do, you, how do you know that? Well, I happen to weigh every single food I eat. So I'm a little bit obsessed about this stuff. <laughs> We hadn't already copied off. And I locked that into a chronometer, which is a uh, where you can track your nutrient and, and calories. It's free, so it doesn't get much cheaper than that. And when I put in that I had my apple and my dark chocolate, it tells me there that that's three and a half grams of fiber, and it's about 9% of the recommended daily intake. 
And then yellow, you can press another button on this app and it will show you a graph. This is the whole time, the five I've eaten since I started logging my food and calories, which is about a year and a half. And you can see it was about 1st November last year. Um, it dropped down and then I went almost nothing. I really tried the carnivore diet there for a month. And as you can see, I went a bit crazy when I came off it. Strawberry season, I think, was coming in. Uh, and then I decided to try it again. And then ever since, since about May this year, uh, yeah, I've been below probably five grams of fiber a day. But low fiber does mean that my protein intake has started to rise since that time. So this is a graph of my, my protein. It's a really cool app, you know, if, you, if you're really nerdy like me about this stuff, um, that's when you can use it in presentations for your friends. So if we, whoop, I'm going the wrong way again. So if you look at my uh, dinner and dessert, and we punch that into the calculator, it will show that for that, that meal was 175 grams of protein. But you can see the carbs are quite low at 16, almost just 17 grams. Now, everybody know what net carbs are compared to just carbs? Nope. Okay, that's basically the carbs that are calculated that gets absorbed as sugar. So fiber is carbs, but it's calculated that that just goes through us. So you take the fiber, subtract that from the carbs, and you get the net carbs. Does that all make sense? I didn't make that too complicated. Um, and that meal is 38% protein, 3% carbs, and 59% fat. So then I get asked sometimes, well, is that a high protein diet? Well, it's a higher protein diet, but you see how the fat is still about 60%. So it's definitely within the realm of low carb, high fat. But actually most of the time, I'll add extra fat to my meals. Like in this picture here. So that was just fat I roasted in the oven, 60 grams of it. I add that to my ribeye steak and my eggs. And then if you look at the composition of that meal, it's a little bit low in protein, a little bit high in fat, and pretty much no carbs. So, another cool thing you can do on Chronometer with the app is you can get a nutrition report for whatever period of time you want. So for the last 10 months, on a daily average, I've eaten 3,042 calories, 2.8 grams of protein a day, 41 carbs, and over 200 grams of fat. See, there's the 2.8 grams of protein. And again, that works out to about the same as the meal before. Okay, 29 grams of protein, maybe a bit higher than normal, 5% uh, carbs, fat, even calculated a little bit of wine and beer I have here and there, so 2% alcohol. The question is though, what happens to body composition when you eat over 200 grams of protein on average every single day for 10 months? Well, it just so happened that at the start of it, I did a scan and last week I did another one. So in that time period, my body weight remained pretty stable. I put on under 400 grams, but I would say that's about the same. However, when you look at the breakdown, I gained 1.2 kilos of lean mass. Now you're supposed to, when you go past 40, not be able to really do that. So I was quite chuffed about that. And then I dropped a little bit of body fat again. So we actually compare the six months before that, if we just compare the uh, protein intake, I was about 150 grams, and that went up to just over 200. So an increase in, in protein every single day, about 50 grams. So what produced this was a little more protein. If we then look at the fat, the previous six months on average, I'd eaten 241 grams, 0.5 a day. That dropped down a little bit. And this goes back to what Nicole was talking about before. You might have to play around with the ratios. 
So my fat dropped slightly less fat. We look at the carbohydrates. Previous six months, I was sitting around that 50 grams or just over. And then that dropped down to about 40. So what also changed was I had slightly less carbs. And then of course, fiber went from 20 grams down to about five on average. Result there, a little more protein, slightly less fat, slightly less carbs, much less fiber. Now calories, calories do matter. So the previous six months I was consuming 3,160 calories on average per day. That dropped down to 3,042. So again, slightly less calories. So that was sort of the factors. And that's suppose the thing when you know you change one thing, well, everything else changes as well. So I had more protein, yes, but because of that, all the others changed. So we just compare the calories the previous six months and those last 10 months. That's a difference of 120 calories per day or about 840 per week. So you could say that look, less calories does equal weight loss. That's true, isn't it? But you could also say that, well, less calories equals weight gain. So less calories can actually equal weight loss and it can equal weight gain, at least in this study. But it produced the kind of loss that I wanted and it produced the kind of gain that I wanted. So it's obviously what we eat is more important than how much we eat, as you've all been told here tonight. Now, just lastly, I want to put exercise in context. I work as an independent exercise consultant. Obviously, I don't advocate running because I get leaner myself by stopping running. Or at least I don't advocate you do 150 kilometers a week, okay? <laughs> running to the bus is okay. Because I do think exercise is crucial for leanness. And obviously I do a fair bit of it myself on a daily basis. Now, most of my clients come to me for weight loss. And what we really mean by that is body fat loss. And I have them sit through extensive slides because I won't obviously show them all to here tonight. Um, but this is the way I explain that to them. What we're after, we're after high muscle mass and low body fat mass. And that is built on a physical activity foundation. <coughs> then I go into numerous slides of defining what that is if you come into my gym. And I won't do that, I won't bore you with that tonight. But let's just say that it is obviously built on that physical activity foundation. However, there's something else holding up that foundation. Anybody care to guess what that might be? No, not, not one. There's no wrong answer. The skeletal system. Your diet, okay? Your diet is what is holding up that your exercise is gonna be effective. And to cut a long story short, basically a low sugar diet. Because what's a low sugar diet gonna make sure that you remain, you're gonna remain insulin sensitive. And then this is my way of showing how then you can release your fat stores and lose weight and use that energy to burn while you're in exercise. Okay, but if you don't get that bottom part right, don't, don't worry about exercising, okay? Because you can run all you like, you can run 150 kilometers a week and you'll still not be as lean as when you dial in your diet. Okay? And then, what I you tell my clients is that, look, you gotta have patience. Okay? And I use my, myself as examples that it didn't happen overnight. Um, but hang in there because you're on the right track. And that's it. Thank you.
Thank you.